Hi, thanks for checking out today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. We are in the second week of the Ripple Effect series, and today Pastor Chad is preaching on 2 Corinthians 9-7, focusing on how to cultivate a winning attitude. You can download and follow along with the Life Notes by visiting calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here is Pastor Chad Garrison. I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians 9 is our text today, and uh, if you don't have a Bible or a Bible app on your device and you're in the room, uh, then I'm just going to, in one in room of any of our campuses, and I'm just going to encourage you to grab a Bible to the seats around you and turn to page 1150, that's page 1150, and you will be able to follow along with us in our text today. And as always, if you're at any of our campuses and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then simply take one. It is our gift to you because we want you to have God's Word and read God's Word. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, just ask for one and we will get one to you. You can message the service host or you can email us at calvaryaz.com. We'd be glad to send you a Bible or deliver a Bible to you because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, before we dive in, I just gotta uh, tell you some really good stuff uh, that's going on and uh, invite some of you to help out with the need. We have a thriving children's ministry at, uh, at all of our campuses, and, and we would love for you to, to know about that, but also we'd love for some of you to help with that. So let me just tell you just a, a little bit about what we have. Right now, this year, we're averaging 214 children every weekend in, in ministries at our campuses. That's Parker and, and Sweetwater. That was polite applause. Anyway, uh, so hey, I hope you guys are rejoicing. But get this, in, in, uh, in Parker, they're averaging 37 children every week. So uh, that's, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Now, here's the thing. We need people who can help us take care of and teach those children. And, uh, and I know some of you are like, I had kids, and I did my part, and I'm done with that. Uh, and uh, I just want to invite you to repent if that's what you're thinking. Uh, because if we're going ha- like, to have an excellent children's ministry, we need excellent children's workers. And, and I look around uh, this room, and I know in Parker campus it's the same way. There are a ton of people with skill and experience and who love kids and want to bless them. And we're not asking for you to sign a contract for a lifetime commitment of every week working in the nursery or every week teaching, you know, eight-year-olds the Bible, but we are asking for help. So here at Sweetwater, we need about 70 volunteers on a regular basis. We've got about 70 different positions that you can volunteer for. Everything from helping people register their kids helping people, uh, you know, or being a teacher, or being a helper in a classroom, holding babies, that kind of stuff, or just being a buddy with some of the kids that need some extra help. And, and so all of those are different positions, and here's what we're gonna do for you, make it really easy. We have a place for you to sign up out in the foyer after the service. You can stop by there if you're at Sweetwater Campus. You can stop by there and you can sign up. If you're at our Parker Campus, you can go to the table there and sign up because we wanna give you that opportunity. Again, it's so easy. If you're at Parker, you can you know, work one service with the kids and then you can go to church the other service. If you're here at Sweetwater, I mean, if you come on Saturday night, you can volunteer to work uh, every other Sunday or something like that. Go and help out one of the services. If you're at our 9.30 or 11 service, then you can, you know, work one service and, and uh, attend one service. It's so easy to bless if you're willing to do that. We're asking our children's ministry, we'd love for you to commit to like twice a month from now till June. And, and that's not like an end of the world kind of commitment, is it? But here's the thing, you gotta pass a background check. I think most of you could probably do that. Uh, you know, you gotta do some training because we care about our kids. Some of it is to like, protect the kids from sexual predators and things like that. We want our people trained well. Uh, there's some training on how to care for kids because not everybody is a natural as you are. But uh, so, so we're asking you guys to do that. So if you're willing to do that, then please stop by the booth, give them your information. They will start the process because it'll take a few weeks to onboard volunteers and, uh, and help us out as we try to minister to the next generation of children here in Lake Havasu and Parker and any place else that God gives us an opportunity. So that's my ask and I would love for you to help us out. Some of you, some of you guys, you're, you're qualified too. Okay, you guys can do this as a couple. What a couple bonding thing to do. Go work in the kids ministry together 
Uh, I'm just saying uh, it would be something that is worthwhile. So uh, please sign up uh, here at Sweetwater, out in the foyer, at Parker, outside. Uh, you will find the table, and uh, let's take care of our kids. What do you guys say? Let's take care of our kids, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah, Everyone who applauds is going to go out there, and they're just going to go and sign up. Hey, uh, who is your favorite football team. Don't just shout it out right now. On the count of three, I want to hear what is your favorite football team. Ready? One, two, three. Yeah. All right. I heard lots of uh, teams. You guys know which one mine is. I decided to wear the jersey since I was going to ask you that. Hey, as a fan, do you want your team to lose or to win? win. I know, which makes it tough when our teams are playing each other, right? Because we're all wanting the same thing. Uh, uh, we love being a part of a winning team. Uh, now, I say that not from experience, uh, at least not most of the time from experience, because I am a Cardinals fan. Although, I will say, when I wrote this sermon, we were not in first place uh, of the division, which we currently are. So, right, right Cardinals fans? Yeah. I'm just saying miracles happen. Uh, that's all. See, and, and what's interesting is when our team is losing, and I have a lot of experience here, Right? When our team is losing, we kind of whine, don't we? Right? We make excuses. It's like, oh, those referees, they cost us the game. Our coach, he doesn't know how to call the plays. Our general manager doesn't know how to draft. Why doesn't he trade for anybody good? You know, it's just all these excuses, and we're just like, I can't wait for the draft. We're just looking forward to the draft. Uh, but when your team is winning, we get happy, don't we? Right? Our team is winning, we start trash talking, we get loud and exuberant, we chest bump, maybe even woohoo. Any woohooers in the room? Yeah, see, you're not supposed to raise your hand, you're supposed to woohoo, you guys did, you guys got it. Some of you did both. See, today we're talking about a winning attitude. And see, we can have a winning attitude because we are on the winning team. Okay, we're on the winning team. Uh, now, that, let me qualify that, because not everybody's on the winning team, but those who are followers of Jesus. So if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you are on the winning team. Okay, not because of you and not because of me, but because Jesus defeated sin, death, and hell when he died on the cross, he declared victory on the cross. Everybody missed it, though. When he said, it is finished, as a battle cry of victory, all right? He said it is finished. So he declared victory on the cross, but publicly, victory was declared on Easter Sunday when they found the tomb empty and Jesus was risen from the dead. And everyone who surrenders to Jesus becomes a winner, that's it. Everyone who surrenders to Jesus, you're on the winning team. That's why the Apostle Paul declared, 1 Corinthians 15, 57, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are on the winning team and we can't lose because Jesus won the victory. Some of you don't believe that, so look at your neighbor and go, you are a winner. Some of y'all need to believe your neighbors, okay? Some of y'all need to tell your face that you're on a winning team, okay? I mean, because some of y'all look like you're on losing teams, even though you're on a winning team because of Jesus, okay? You don't feel it, but you're, you're still on a winning team. So that truth should give us a reason to rejoice or woohoo, yeah. <laughs> My woohooers let me down. I mean, you guys, I, I was ready. You're, you woohooed earlier and I was like, Rejoice? Okay, never. No, we're not going to do it. All right. <laughs> See, that is our spiritual victory in Jesus. So now let me just take a moment and discuss some of Calvary's victories. Because we're on the winning team, and God is at work changing lives through the ministries of Calvary. We're getting to see those victories day after day. Uh, I mean, literally, every week we see victories, sometimes every day. And I, I'm just going to brag for a moment, Okay. Uh, I just want to tell you stuff that you may not know about the ministries of Calvary and what God is doing. So uh, I already told you about the kids' ministry and what's going on with that. But in 2024, our average worship attendance for in-person is 1,992 people a week. Yeah. 
Yeah, some of you are woo-hooing. That's just under 2,000 people a week, and, uh, and I'm just like, wow, that is really cool. Now, uh, online attendance, so those of you joining us online, you might think, I'm the only one watching. You're not. We got, uh, let me check the numbers, make sure I get these right. 1,436 people a week tune in, live streaming or on demand. Yeah. So, I mean, there's like over 3,400 people a weekend that are joining us in worship and celebrating Jesus with us. Uh, besides that, uh, again, there's no reason for you to know this, but uh, Calvary is the leading church in terms of giving to missions in our Arizona Mission Network. And we're the lead, and that's been for like the last 10 plus years. Uh, and we're the leading church when it comes to baptisms over the last 10 years as well. Yeah. So speaking of baptisms, uh, in the last five years, we have baptized over 1,100 new believers. That's kind of cool, isn't it? That's life change. I mean, we, we're, we exist to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, and we're seeing that happen. Uh, you know, uh, in uh, 2019, we launched our Parker campus, and so uh, those of you in Parker, you can celebrate that loudly. Uh, but 2019, we, we started our Parker campus. And this past April, you guys got into your new building. Parker campus got in their new building. And uh, since they got into their building, they've been averaging 211 attenders a weekend. That is cool, isn't it? Parker, I can't hear you. You guys got to be louder. So... And in addition to that, we are preparing to launch our North Havasu campus. So we're going to have a North campus. And, and if you don't know where that is, it's out London Bridge Road, out by the Refuge, that area. And, uh, we, you know, they've already got a, a group that's, that's ready to go with uh, about 85 people a weekend. But we're going to have two Christmas Eve services. We're going to promote that with a live nativity. And we're going to have, they're going to be launching two services in January in their remodeled facility. So... Uh, it's kind of cool that things that God is doing. See, we're making a difference in our communities. We're impacting Parker and Havasu all the way to the ends of the earth. We are a winning team. Now, in large part, that is due because we have uh, a winning attitude. So let's talk about the winning attitude. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. We looked at verse 6 last week, uh, but I'm going to read it again. The Apostle Paul says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, Paul describes a winning attitude in verse 7, but I just want to remind you from last week of the biblical principles of generosity. That's what we talked about last week. If you missed last week, you might want to go back and watch this. But real quickly, the principles are simply this. The three things that we teach here at Calvary, biblical principles of generosity. Okay, some of you know them. You can say them with me. God doesn't need your money. The church doesn't need your money. But we, as followers of Jesus, need to give. Why do we need to give? Because of what Paul said. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. He's going, hey, you got, the, you got the choice about how much blessing you get in your life. Not what type of blessing, but, what, uh, but the amount of blessing. So we want to be blessed, so we generously invest in the mission of life change. We serve our communities, we give our time, talents, and energy, and we practice generosity, finding and supporting the life-changing ministry of Calvary. So that's, that's what we're doing. Okay, that's the winning attitude. Then in verse seven, Paul mentions two characteristics that help shape that winning attitude. And, and I, wanna, I want us to look at these because I want us to not only know that we're on a winning team, but I want us to have a winning attitude as individuals, okay? We want to have a winning attitude. So the first characteristic of a winning attitude is it is decisive. A winning attitude is decisive. Paul says, each one should give as he has decided in his heart. As you have decided in your heart. Uh, Paul says, you gotta decide what kind of person you wanna be. At Calvary, look, we're direct without uh, trying to manipulate. 
okay? We're, we're pretty upfront about what, uh, what we do. We don't try to guilt anyone into giving. Guilt is a terrible motivation. I know a lot of churches try using guilt. Uh, I don't want to guilt you into giving. I want to gratitude you into giving. Think about that. I don't want to guilt you into giving. I want to gratitude you into giving because I want you to realize how much God has blessed you and out of gratitude, I want you to give back to God. As you decide, not, not, we're not telling you what to give. You got to make that decision on what to do. And by the way, as I mentioned last week, the pastors at Calvary don't know what anybody gives. That is between you and God. And okay, the financial secretary ha- turns it into the, you and the IRS. So, so there's that. So there's, there, you know, there's that whole you know, trust thing. We, we don't know what anybody gives. And we don't want to know because we don't, be, we don't want to be tempted to play favorites as James chapter 2 warns us. Uh, so we're not trying to guilt trip you. Uh, we are trying to gratitude trip you. And, uh, and you have the facts. You know what the Bible says. So you have to decide what are you gonna give? How are you gonna serve? Who are you gonna influence to lead to a life-changing relationship with Jesus? You see, a winning attitude decides to give and then a winning attitude is cheerful. It's cheerful, right? Did you catch that? Each one should give as he's decided in his heart, not grudgingly, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Isn't that interesting? God loves a cheerful giver. Now, okay, technically, God loves everyone. He loves grumpy givers. (laughs) He loves joyful, disobedient people. You know, he just, he loves people, right? He loves... You can be selfish and God still loves you. So what does Paul mean when he says God loves a cheerful giver? Well, understand this. God is generous. It is his nature to be generous. I mean, James chapter one says, every good and perfect gift comes from above from the Father in whom there is no shifting shadow. Everything good in your life is from God. We know that God loves to give because Jesus told us in John chapter three, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. God sacrificed everything for you so that you could be his children, so you could be in his family. He is generous and God delights when his children live out his character. When we give cheerfully, gratefully, then God smiles on us. Okay, do you get that? When you model the character of Christ, then God is delighted and he smiles on his children in the same way that you smile on your children and your grandchildren when they hit the winning home run. Did anybody get excited when your kids or grandkids do the sports thing? Yeah? How about, do you guys get excited when uh, your kids or grandkids win an award for excellence in the arts or scholastics? You don't sound like it. I mean, come on. Do you guys get excited when they graduate from high school or college or the military and become responsible adults? Yeah. <laughs> There's the goal right there. It's like, yes. Yes. See, I, are there any woohoo parents in here? Yeah. See, I knew it. You see, here's the thing. When we embrace generosity like our Heavenly Father, then I think God celebrates uh, maybe even woohoos. You know, I mean, come on, why not? We're doing it, we're made in his image. We get excited when our kids model what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We, you know, we get excited when our kids do the things that we're proud of them for. God gets excited when his kids follow him like he wants. And that's what it means when God loves a cheerful giver. Yes, he loves everybody, but he he gets excited about that. Now, I grew up in legalistic type churches. Right? They taught me about Jesus. They taught me about grace. They taught us giving, but the emphasis was on obedience. Okay? Give obediently. Give obediently. Now, and some people gave cheerfully, and a lot of people gave grudgingly. Some, of course, didn't give at all. That's typical. But see, a winning attitude recognizes the sacrifice of Jesus to rescue us from hell, knows that every good thing in life comes from God, and decides to give cheerfully out of gratitude and a desire to impact the world with the gospel of Jesus. Let me say that again. I want you to hear this. A winning attitude recognizes the sacrifice of Jesus to rescue us from hell, knows that every good thing in life comes from God, and decides 
to cheerfully give out of gratitude and a desire to impact the world for Jesus. That's what a winning attitude looks like. That's what it means. Each one should give as he has decided in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, if you're not sure if you're a cheerful giver or not, let me give you a heart check. Okay, this is just kind of a self-test. You and the Holy Spirit can have a conversation about this in this coming week. The heart check is simply this. Do you want to give more or do you want to give less? See, we all know the church answer is more. But I'm not talking about the church answer. I'm not talking about getting the answer right. I'm talking about where is your heart when it comes to generosity. Do you desire to give more or do you desire to give less? Uh, uh, look, just for instance, do you round up or round down on tips? Okay, well, yeah, you guys all know the answer here. Okay, the answer isn't here. The answer is when you push that little button or write it down on the thing. I mean, some of you are like, I don't know. I can't hardly do math to figure it out. So um, I like it when they pre-print them for me so I can just pick. Um, do, you get, do you get excited about your contributions or do you give reluctantly? In other words, when, you, when you're giving, is it, does it bring joy to you or do you just like, all right, I gotta write the check again? Not that you write the check, the computer does. But, um, you know, oh, I gotta do this again. Uh, do you get excited when we mention opportunities to bless or in your spirit you groan because like, oh, they're asking for money again. Hungry kids someplace. They wanna build wells someplace. We wanna build another house for people in Mexico. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Look. I've been in church a long time. I know what people think. <laughs> I've heard them say it. They're always got their hand out there. I always want more. We're giving you opportunities. Look, and here's what it boils down to. Are you living like the fan of a winning team or a supporter of a losing franchise? See, it's all about that attitude. A winning team. Remember, you're trash talking. You're up. You're all excited. You're woo-hooing. Yes, but if you're on a losing team, you're whining and complaining and uh, grumbling and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and here's the thing, we're on a winning team. We've already established that because of Jesus. We know we're on the winning team. Then why do we have a whining attitude? You see, if we want to see God's blessings grow in our lives, then we need to adapt a winning attitude and repent of the whining attitude. Um, I think about it this way. You really only have three options when it comes to giving, okay? You can give cheerfully, kind of like God loves. You can give grudgingly, you know, obedient giving. I grew up around a lot of that. Or you can just not give. Whether you're joyful in that or guilty in that, you can just not give. Three options. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I grew up with disciplinarian parents. Anyone else? Okay, some of you didn't raise your hands. God bless you. Uh, but I had chores to do. How many of you grew up with chores? Okay, All right. oh, a lot more chores. Okay, so I grew up with chores, and if my parents told me, you need to do this, I had three choices. I could say, okay, I will do this because you guys let me live here, and you feed me food, and you do my laundry, and, and, uh, and I have a bed to sleep in and clothes to wear. Thank you, I'm gonna go do my chores. I did not do that most of my childhood. Or... I could go, all right, fine, I'm gonna go do the chores, let's go do it. it that which is most of the time my attitude. Uh, or I could just go, I'm not doing that. <laughs> now, which one didn't end well? <laughs> yeah, so you guys know. God invites us into his kingdom, and we have three options. We, we can participate joyfully, we can participate grudgingly. Either one of those is obedience, one reflects a winning attitude, one reflects a losing attitude, uh, or we can just be disobedient non-givers and that hurts us because the one who sows sparingly reaps sparingly and the one who sows bountifully reaps bountifully. See, everything we do has a ripple effect in our lives and on the people around us. And so I wanna, I wanna kind of close with the challenge. I wanna challenge you to make an impact. See, again, I, I don't know where anybody is in the whole giving thing. I don't know where anybody is in, in their commitments to, to supporting the ministry of Calvary. 
but I just want you to know your life has an effect on others way beyond what you see. That's why we're calling this a ripple effect because as you participate in God's kingdom, that ripple effect just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and you don't even get to see the end results. Um, how many of you remember a teacher or a coach or a Bible teacher from your youth that had an impact on you? Yeah, a bunch of you do. So uh, I, I, I wrote this and, and I thought, oh, you know what? I had this like... Uh, uh, leader of our boys' mission group when I was like in third and fourth grade. His name was Mr. Pulley. And, and uh, we, we had a lot of fun, but uh, I remember he would pick us up on Wednesdays and take uh, all these boys to the nursing home and we would sing hymns to the little old ladies. <laughs> Wasn't my favorite thing to do because they always wanted to hug us and I was like creeped out by that, all right? <laughs> And I realize now I'm like one of these old men that uh, could be there. But, <laughs> but as an eight, nine-year-old, that, you know, but, but I remember he took us and we did this like, you know, at least once a month. It seemed like four times a week, but it was like once a month. <laughs> and I can still sing those, those hymns uh, to this day. And I'm going, wow, that, that had an impact on me because I still think we ought to, you know, bless people in Jesus' name. And, and then when I was in junior high, and I was an annoying junior higher, okay? Just ask my wife. She knew me then. I was an annoying junior higher. And uh, there was this lady, again, in uh, youth Sunday school. Her name was Mrs. Rumpf. And, uh, and, and she was just an encourager. I was a bratty, snot-nosed, know-it-all little seventh grader because I knew the Bible because I went to Sunday school every moment from when I was born. And, uh, and so I knew this stuff, but she just kept encouraging me and, and loving me and welcoming me. And these are people that had an impact uh, far beyond what they knew. I mean, here it is uh, over 50 years later, and I'm talking about them in church. How, how many of you remember something that somebody said that surprised you and motivated you? Anybody, anybody have one of those? There's somebody just spoke into your life. You didn't see it coming. You didn't expect it. And then suddenly you're like, wow, I, I, I got to act on that. Uh, how many of you have had their life impacted by a church anytime, any place? Okay. Some of you are asleep because you raise your hand and you're in this church. <laughs> see, the, the reality is this. Someone blessed you directly or indirectly. And, and I want to challenge you to bless other people Three tangible ways, okay? Three really important tangible ways. First way is to tithe. Like again, I don't know what you give, so I'm starting here. Uh, obedient giving, according to the word of God, is 10%. That's a tithe. Old Testament, God used it to fund the temple and to feed the priests and the Levites. And, and so it carries over the New Testament church practice that. Jesus affirmed that. Uh, and I would love everyone to step into obedient giving, you know, do the chores that your father gave for you to do. Uh, because it will bless you. Uh, but today, I'm just gonna challenge you to take a step of obedience uh, in, the, in the direction of following, following Christ. By the way, the average committed church attender gives less than 4% of their income to church, and that's including averaging those people that are giving 10% or more. So the average, uh, I, I hope you're way above average. But here's the challenge. If you give absolutely nothing, then can I just encourage you to start giving something? Take a step. If you, if you give nothing, give something. If you give occasionally, can I encourage you just to give regularly? Just decide, hey, I'm gonna give every month. You know, you, you can set up, you know, automatic uh, withdrawals, you know, either through the website, you can do it through your own bill pay, you, you can bring the cash or the money or whatever. Just, you know, do that, do regular. If you give regularly, can I encourage you to start tithing? And some of you are like, 10%, I could never afford 10%. Well, then pick a number and start there and work your way up. If you need to start at 2%, start there and see what God does. Uh, a few years ago, I had this conversation after a sermon like this, and, and one of the guys, and he's a, one of our deacons now, but back then he was just attending, and he goes, uh, there's no way I can get 10%. That's just, I'm on a fixed income, I'm on disability, I can't afford it. And I go, well, what can you, what do you want to try? And he goes, I'll, I'm going to try 5%. I was like, okay, try 5%, see what God does. Three months later, he comes back to me and says, hey, guess what? I did 5% and now, God, look, God provided so well, I gotta do 10%. <laughs> and he started tithing and he's like, man, this is so good. God just gives more than I can imagine. And, and I'm just telling you, that's how it works. But you gotta take that step of obedience and see what God does. Remember, whoever sows sparingly, reaps sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully, reaps bountifully. Secondly, 
Uh, can I just challenge you to be involved in Limitless? Now, let me qualify this. Limitless, you know, is our building campaign, and uh, we, we had, you know, dinners last year, last February, uh, inviting you to participate. A lot of you came to those. About 1,000 people came to those. Uh, we're going to have a follow-up dinner in January this year for people who missed it, so if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can, you can attend then. Uh, but uh, I challenge people, above the tithe... Because I want you to tithe. I want you to be obedient. I want you to live in the blessings of God. But if you already do that, then give above the tithe to the Limitless Campaign. What are we raising money for? To pay off our Parker campus. And guess what, Parker? You guys are completely paid off. Yeah. They're cheering in Havasu too. And then we're gonna, hey, this, this coming summer, we're gonna put a balcony in here, a mezzanine in this room in Sweetwater. And, and uh, you know, we need, we're raising money to do that. We need about $600,000 more to pay that off full, plus all the, you know, other stuff that goes with it, like additional parking and some other upgrades. So, you know, we're on our way to having that money in hand so that we can pay cash. And then we're gonna be raising money for the future for a, a children's building with office space in it so for our team. So, you know, that's all in the future. That's gonna cost us another three million on top of that. Now, some have the means to give regular ongoing contributions. Praise God. If you can do that, great. Some of you, honestly, have the means to write the check right now and pay for the whole thing. You do what God tells you to do. But see, this is a legacy ripple effect that's gonna touch lives for generations or until Jesus comes. Either way, it's a win. Third challenge. I just want to challenge you to create a generous, winning attitude legacy for your family. Create a legacy based on your, your generosity, based on your joy, based on your attitude. Just give that example for your family because it's the best legacy that you can leave your kids and your grandkids. If they know that you, uh, you know, as their parent or their grandparent, just said, hey, I value the kingdom of God so much that I joyfully supported it and promoted it and served in it and encouraged people in it. You do that and it's gonna have a ripple effect because nothing else impacts like a life that makes a difference for Jesus. So are you modeling a winning attitude or a whining attitude? Your decision is gonna impact all of those around you and those who come behind you. Each one should give as he has decided in his heart to give, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the way that you have blessed us. You did not leave us in our sin destined for hell, you sent Jesus into this world to pay the price for our rebellion and to rescue us and give us life eternal, make it possible for us to become children of God with heaven as our destiny. God, we cannot thank you enough for that. Not only that, but you fill our lives with good things and because and, every good thing comes from you. And we thank you for that. And so God, we simply wanna have a heart that reflects your heart. We want to live as children of God, generous, loving, serving, supporting. Uh, God, you are the one who has uh, blessed. So, so we, we thank you for those blessings, but we want to be a blessing for others. So we're listening for your voice. Speak to us now. We're going to obey you, whatever you lead us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. That's right. If you've given your life to Jesus and follow his direction, you're on the winning team. So I encourage you to accept the challenge and make an impact for the kingdom. If you're unsure how to give your life to Jesus or have questions about what it means to follow him, I invite you to contact us. You can send us an email to questions at calvaryaz.com and one of our pastors will reach out to you. Well, that's all for today. Please join us again next week. Bye-bye.
Are you looking for a way to dive deeper into scripture and make it a part of your daily routine? Check out Calvary's Word for the Day daily devotional videos. Visit calvaryaz.com forward slash D-E-V-O and sign up to receive these three to five minute devotionals right to your inbox each day. Our team of pastors and leaders share meaningful insights from the Bible to equip and encourage you in your faith journey. Don't miss out on this opportunity to grow in your relationship with God and connect with the community of believers. Sign up today and start receiving your daily dose of scripture.